from tote bags to t-shirts, from mugs to mouse pads, and many things in between. All of them can be found right now at the Politocrat Daily Podcast online store. You can find them as part of the brand new Spring Spectacular Collection for 2021. All items designed by yours truly, Omar Moore. So take a look around. Lots to see. Lots of colors as well. There's surely something for you at the Politocrat Daily Podcast online store in the brand new Spring Spectacular Collection for 2021. More items are to be added. They are coming. So stay tuned for more and visit right now the dash politocrat dot my shopify dot com or you can go to the politocrat dot com and scroll down to the online store on the home page thank you very much for your support please patronize the store right now Welcome to the Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Sunday, February the 7th, 2021. On this episode of the Politocrat, the system, the system, the system. Call it the system's system. This is kind of bad news. So maybe you can stop listening right here. But for the rest of you brave souls, there is more to come. Coming up next. Yesterday was the one-month mark of the terrorist attack of January the 6th, 2021. It was only four weeks ago and one day ago from this very day that that terrorist attack occurred. And as far as even maybe 50% of the American population is concerned, it happened five months ago, five years ago, or never at all. But I am not going to be talking about the American public by and large in this episode. I am not going to be talking about white people in particular by and large in this episode. I... I'm going to be talking about something that you can feel if you are black or brown or Native American, or perhaps if you're white to a certain degree, certainly if you're not making millions and millions of dollars a year. A year. I'm going to talk about the system. It is something that governs all of us. And don't be depressed at me, for I am only conveying What is out here? What people don't want to articulate but know in their souls. In fact, in the interest of not trying, not even calculating, to want to put you down in the dumps. Because you're perhaps already there with a coronavirus in the United States that has already killed about half a million people, if not more. And globally over 2 million people. But I guess some of you have a Super Bowl to watch. (laughs) Today. And that's part of the issue too. As a foreword of sorts. To this audio book you are hearing. Metaphorical audio book. I was walking through the streets of San Francisco, California, just a few hours, well, ago. 
from the previous day, Saturday. And you would have thought that there was no pandemic in sight. You would have thought that half a million people in the same country that they were sitting in, drinking their wine, talking at high volume, laughing and shouting, that 500,000 people in the same country they live in hadn't died. It's as if that's what they actually felt. The people I saw in the city I live in, on the streets I walk on. There's something really evil about that. But I will tell you that it is not entirely those selfish people's faults. I'll tell you whose fault it is. In fact, I'm going to take this particular episode in very discreet doses. I'll be right back. Warning. The remainder of this episode may cause cynicism and may contain a healthy or unhealthy dose of it. Listener discretion is not advised at all. Welcome back. I think that the reason that you had a bunch of entitled people, entitled white people specifically, out and about, at bars, albeit outdoors, but that's not the point because that's still not a very smart thing to do. Even though we know that the virus does not spread so much outdoors, it's the fact that people were in clusters outdoors, barely separated by anything, not even cellophane, that just is inviting a spread of this virus again. And the reason why you saw all of these entitled people, the reason why I saw them, is because I had to get to where I had to get to. And rather than walk seven or eight to ten blocks out of my way just to go down a straight path on a street, I thought it just judicious to be sensible. And so that's what I did. I walked. And street after sidewalk after street after sidewalk. Packed. Packed. And it was as if there was no pandemic. It was as if there was no terrorist attack. It was as if. We were still in 2018 or 19. Staggering. It was as if the people completely forgot there was a pandemic. And no, I am not advocating that people be all gloom and doom and down in the dumps. I know that some of you might think that that's the kind of thing I bring you on a daily basis on this podcast. But I dare contest that. I think that, as I've said before, You have to be some kind of optimist. You have to be some kind of fairly, quote-unquote, cheerful, loving person to be delivering some of the kinds of things that you hear on this podcast that you listen to, some of you very faithfully, and I thank you. Because someone who would be in a perpetual state of depression couldn't possibly have the mental energy or the sanguine disposition, as yours truly actually does, to deliver podcast after podcast daily, yes, daily, every single day, for almost a year now, as I have done, if they were in that position of being depressed. It just wouldn't happen. But I want to get back to the topic of the system. Because I think that the system itself is the thing 
that actually helps give license to privileged, selfish people to go out and have a banquet. Yeah, I know people have had enough of being locked in their homes. I know it's kind of like a house arrest to some of you. I get it. You want to breathe again. Some of you don't want to wear the stinking mask. In fact, very few people want to wear the stinking mask unless they're going to a fancy dress party, a Halloween party, or some kind of sex party. But since pretty much all of those options are off the table in COVID land, then we just have to do what we've got to do. And be good boys, girls, and people. And wear these masks. Wear them. I see people walking now. As I did yesterday. With their masks again under their chins. Just when I thought I could celebrate for five and a half minutes. Five or five and a half minutes. Yay, everyone's wearing a mask. Oh. No, survey says no, Mr. Moore. They're walking around with masks under their chin. Around their neck. It's really awful. You really see how disgusting people are. Some of them. You see the good people who are decent and who care. And then you see these really disgusting reptilian base people. Who were like that all along. But... Now they don't have to bother about the Hester Prynne letter on them that is scarlet. They don't have to worry about it because the mask around their neck or not at all on their face is the scarlet letter that says scoundrel, scumbag and selfish all at the same time. It's an S for stupid. And sociopathic. But I contend to you that the system has got everything to do with this. Because the system tells you in America. In fact, it tells you anywhere in the world about America. The American dream means you can do what you wish. The American dream means that you can be free, white, and 21. As Bell Hooks once famously wrote. About that Forward phrase. Free, white, and 21. That carefree attitude that has those people packed on sidewalks because they want to go out somewhere. They can't wait. They're like a pack of cockroaches. They've got to be outside and all clung together. I am not advocating house arrest. I am not. I am advocating a little bit of sensitivity. A little bit of uh, Ralph Tresvant. A man with sensitivity. I am I'm advocating a little bit of judiciousness. Somehow. Because the governor that we have in the state of California probably buckled to pressure from corporate donors who are corporate business persons and flung open the doors of this state here in California just uh, what just about two weeks ago now and did it without warning, by the way. He didn't give anybody a heads up. Well, we're going to do this in the next couple of days. He's not like Boris Johnson, the prime minister of my native country, who tells people, well, we're going to do this, but we're going to do it a week from now. We're going to do it three days from now. We're going to institute a lockdown three days, four days from now. Oh, great. You know, why can't you do it right now, Boris Johnson? Oh, no, we're going to do it in four days. We're going to do it in three. We're going to do it in two days. Why the hell didn't you do it immediately? Oh, we're going to do it in three. You know, no, not not our governor here. Mr. Sunshine himself. Gavin Newsom. I'm going to just fling open the doors now. You know, dead of winter. Dead of winter. Let's fling open the doors of California. Never mind we have, what, almost 40,000 people dead here from coronavirus. 
just under 10% of the whole national total population of people who have died from the virus. I'm just going to fling open my doors. Huh? Huh? That'll teach him. Fling open the doors of the state where all the Latinos are dying. No, maybe that's uh, Gavin and Newsom. Yeah, Gavin and Newsom. Gavin and Newsom's uh, edition of herd immunity. It's, It's this really evil take on let's kill all the lawyers, right? Which is let's get rid of the Latino population. Because they're the one. I mean, if that's what is that what we're looking at in, here in California, L.A. County, arguably one of the two or three counties in the entire country with the highest rate of death. Are we looking at let them die? Is that what we're looking at here? I mean, we knew that the previous occupant in the White House was all about that. But the whole point of me mentioning all this is about a system in place. People in power making these decisions about your life. People in power knew for years that a pandemic was likely. It was being warned about by people like Bill Gates in 2015 or thereabouts. It was being warned about by President Obama at the time, around 2011, I don't know, when, 11 or so, or whenever it was, 2009. It was being warned about by George W. Bush, of all people, the war criminal, back in his day, around 2005 or six, It had been warned about forever. So how, in God's name, could government officials in state, local, and federal somehow not have a proper plan in place? But the rich could. And I know there are people who follow me on Twitter who may be wealthy. I'm not talking about you and you and you and you and you. I'm talking about the multi-billionaire class. And maybe you did get a vaccine already, even if you're not 65 and older. You know, come on now. Do you not think that people who are very well off in this country or quite frankly, who are famous, do you not think that they got the vaccine ahead of time or certainly got a leg up, terrible words to use because they are not appropriate here, not in this context. But you know what I mean. You don't think that that position got them some time and got them an advantage? That's part of the system. That is part of the system. So with a vaccine, oh, you know, The rich don't have to do much of anything to get it. They don't have to do much of anything. They basically have the stuff sent to them or they have their appointments and it's done with. What do you think happened on January the 20th when you saw celebrities hugging and kissing and politicians hugging each other? Do you honestly think that all the people that you saw on that stage, on the steps of that capital, the one that had been attacked by terrorists, Just two weeks prior, do you not think, dear listener, that all of the people who are hugging and kissing and greeting and holding on that stage at the Capitol, do you not think, dear listener, that they got shots? They're two shots. Do you not think they got those shots? Or do you think they did? Because, come on now, they surely got their two shots or jabs, as they call it in my country. It's, it's obvious. Obvious. Meanwhile, you have neither your jab nor your stimulus check of $1,400. Heck, you probably don't even have your $600 check. I mean, did you get that yet? This is all about a system. This is all about a system that gives the billionaire class its tax cuts over and over and over over the last four years and before then. While you and I and the average person are left holding the bag. And that is a bag. 
that has a promissory note on it, as Dr. King once said, marked insufficient funds. Because the funds are very sufficient when it comes to voting for a multi-billion dollar defense bill, military bill. The funds are very much in evidence for that. Guns and weaponry and bipartisanship in voting on it. The funds are very much available. But when it comes to getting you your vaccine shot, when it comes to getting you your stimulus check, when you have coronavirus and you don't have your job anymore, and you are on the verge of being tossed to the streets of life. All of a sudden, you've got people in Congress hemming and hawing. You've got people looking the other way and saying, no way, Jose, not this way. No money for you or you or you or you. That's too much money. You already had $600. You want to get greedy now? 1400 And it really should be 2000 President Biden. But again, it's a system. It's a system that holds you hostage. And takes forever for you to get the money you need to ease your economic burden. And by the way, $1,400 is nothing. If you are a family of four, $1,400 is nothing at all to live on. It's nothing. Even if each of you gets that money, a family of four, you'll burn through that in three days. Maybe four, max. All the things you've got to do, pay bills, take care of the kids, and this and that and the other. I mean, come on. That's just... But the rich have their vaccine. That's a system thing, folks. You can't tell me that they didn't know. That when those briefings took place in the U.S. Senate in 2020, January of 2020 to be precise, while that impeachment trial was going on, you can't tell me that they weren't told. Of course they were. You had at least two or three members of the United States Senate who traded on this information and nothing happened to them. Thankfully, voters got rid of two of them, voting them out. But this is about the system. This is about the system. I'm going to tell you a bit more about the system, just in case you didn't know. (laughs) Of course you know. And I know you know. But this is something you may not have heard before. And I'm going to talk about it next. I think to talk about the system, you know, it's this big behemoth, but it's orchestrated and it's really powerful and people have been killed by it in so many ways, generally, literally, metaphorically, individually and as a group. I mean, we've seen this forever. It's a system based upon white dominance, whiteness and anti-blackness and anti-color. And on oppression of people in those ranks. But I really think that what happens is is that the system has set up a game of personalities. So that we are always looking at individuals who are supposed to be responsible for wrongdoing. And it's been cultural to this country and others forever. But that is how a system survives. By forcing the general public to focus on individuals, not on a system, but individuals, because that's the way the system gets to distract you from the fact that it is doing all of these things to you. Because if you can talk about Donald Trump 
as odious and as evil as he is. If you can talk about Marjorie Taylor Greene as evil as she is, if you can talk about the Republican Party as evil as they are and talk about some of the individuals in that party or even talk about the party itself, then you'll be too busy crying bloody murder against them to notice that it is the system that is the thing that is the orchestrator of the lot of them. It is the system that is the actual producer of all of these people. These people would not exist without the system that helped them, that pushed them along to do its bidding. And that's what I think some people fail to realize. I think that many intelligent, so-called intelligent people, so-called educated people fall into this very trap. Heck, I've fallen into this trap too at times. But even I have been careful to say that while Donald Trump is a menace and a national security disaster and a threat to it, and while Marjorie Taylor Greene and the Republicans are, even I have tweeted, even I, that the biggest national security threat is the very system itself. That's the national security threat. And I've said it before here, so it's not exactly new news to some of you who listen to this podcast regularly. But that's the thing. It is a design that the system never is held accountable. And when anyone dares to try to hold it accountable, they are assassinated. I cannot think more plainly of an example of this than Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was assassinated on April the 4th, 1968. Again, as I often say, 1968, in my view, is the most consequential year in the history of the United States of America. Notice I said in the history of the United States of America, not in the history of America. Big difference. Because America is America. And you could be talking technically about Canada or Mexico, Central America, you know. But the United States is very specific. The Americas, that's a continent, right? The Americas. There's North, Central, South, Latin America as well. So you get the idea. The United States is a country. country. And I tell you that 1968 is the most consequential. I'm telling you it is. Now you may disagree, but I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You may disagree all you want, but I'm right. <laughs> I can actually laugh during this one. I Look, I laugh a lot. But I am not here to defend or justify myself. Because it's not me that some people should be bristling at. It is the truth that they should be hearing. And then trying to figure out what to do in response. Because again, I, I say this to you. The system has you looking at personalities, gossiping about personalities and the news stories and the tweets and the trending topics all about individuals. When was the last time you saw a trending topic on Twitter about the system that allows January 6, 2021 to happen? When did you ever see a trending topic on that? When did you see a trending topic on Twitter or any other social media that talked in depth about the fact that over the last 11 months, if not longer, there has been a system in place that will not hold Donald Trump or anybody else accountable for this lying to the American public, high crime and misdemeanor, and causing the deaths of half a million people. By the way, it's more than a misdemeanor when you commit genocide. I might have you know. I have you know that it ain't a misdemeanor. 
it is genocide and it is a high crime or maybe a low down dirty crime to lie to us after you told Bob Woodward the truth for a friggin' stinking book. Well, it's a decent book if you read it, but you know what I mean. The desire for Donald Trump to tell the truth for once in a blooming book was more important than your life or the lives of nearly half a million people that he murdered. And he didn't have to murder them all physically. Didn't. He knew what his position was. And he knew that people would follow it. Some of them would. But as long as the system has you and I talking about this person and that person and what some blooming idiot said on This Week with George Stephanopoulos or what someone like Don Lemon failed to do in a question or what someone else said when they hammered away at Van Jones or hammered away at Scaramucci or as long as you're still wound up in that kind of meaningless nonsense, you will never, ever even think to hold a system accountable. You won't. You know why? Not only because you are engaged in the mindless, trivial garbage that Twitter can be sometimes, but also because I think deep down in some people, there is a fear because they don't want to dare challenge a system. A, because it's too overwhelming. B, because they fear the reprisals of trying to challenge it. And C, because it's way too exhausting. And D, because they want to live some semblance of a quote-unquote normal life. But what kind of life is that if you've got a system that's murdering black and brown people on a daily basis and you just sit there and try to live some semblance of normality while you've got people dying like flies, dropping like flies around you? Ooh, God. Isn't that macabre in some way, shape or form to you? Do you belong to that class, low class, of people who pack the sidewalks? In San Francisco. Couldn't wait to get out. I can't wait to get away. I had to run outside. and Sit with 15 of my closest friends. Jam packed on sidewalks. I mean I'm sure they do this. Uh, down in Los Angeles. I know they do. I know they do. I've been told. And I've watched the news down there. You don't have to be down in Los Angeles. To see this. It's pretty damn despicable and tasteless and insensitive. But who gives a fuck about sensitivity? Nobody cares. I mean, people care. You care. But you know what I'm saying. Oh, you know, I'm just going to go out and bum rush the restaurant. And I'm going to be outside and, you know, no real partitioning. There's a few. But, hey, we're outdoors. I can't get it anyway. And, huh, Besides, I already have my vaccine shot, so I don't have to wear a mask. The ignorance is an all-time high, and the system perpetuates that. And the system has us, intelligent people like you, like me, and like everybody we know. Talking about stuff that half the time will not impact anything. It is like an entertainment from distraction about the real deal that is going on in this country. We don't want to face these things. I think James Baldwin is correct again, yet again. Is that the American people, he's paraphrasing someone he knew who told him this. The American people can't stomach much reality at all. Which is why I held that episode a few days ago about whether your social media Persona is the same as the one you really lead. I did that for a reason. All of these things are connected, you know. That's a little secret about this podcast. I never put anything down here by coincidence. And I always look back and use it again as a continuum. Because that's what history is. 
The present is a continuum. History is a continuum. It does not stop. What happened in 1865 or 1619 or 1943 or 33 or 1870 or 1215 or 1492, it doesn't just stop at that year that it happened. These are continuums. Systems do have us thinking about the individuals. So we get outraged, and rightly so, by the way, at a Donald Trump, at an Emily Murphy. I bet you've already forgotten who Emily Murphy is, haven't you now? Haven't you? Haven't you? Haven't you? (laughs) I know some of you haven't, but some of you have. Come on. Come on now. Emily Murphy. Don't look it up. Don't look her name up. Please, think, think, think. Tell me who Emily Murphy is. You don't know, do you? You've forgotten. You've forgotten. Huh? 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 (laughs) Oh, I'm terrible. I know. I know. I know. But you listen to me. Because some of you do like to listen. (laughs) Do you like to watch? (laughs) Oh, dear, dear, dear. Well, if you like to listen, you do like to watch. I mean, again, I don't want to, I'm not going to go off topic here, so I won't mention the incident. Oh, jeez. Sorry. I went a week without mentioning it, except tonight was the, uh, or rather, last night. What night? What day is it now? <laughs> I mean, this is the COVID brain thing, you know? Anyway, COVID brain strikes again. COVID brain strikes again. Yeah, that rhymes. Well, anyway, look, here's what I'm trying to say to you, is that we are caught in the system's grip. I know, it's depressing, isn't it? Oh, I'm the bearer of bad news that you already knew. I'm articulating the bad news you already know, and the system already knows you know. You've got the wiretaps. You've got weird things happen to your phone. I know I've had some very unusual things happen to my phone, and you have too. You've had voices interrupting your phone call. Maybe it's a cross line. Maybe it's a whatever line it is, but it's weird sometimes. You've had that happen, some of you. Come on. If you have a cell phone, you've had it happen to you at least once. I know I have. It's really scary stuff, actually. All of a sudden, you're talking to someone, and this third voice comes on like this and talks. Or this third voice says, Now, and it is really bizarre. That's happened to me at least twice. Tell me what your experience with that is. Have you had something like that happen to you? Email me at this address, politocratpod at gmail.com, politocratpod at gmail.com. You tell me, write to me, write to me. And let me know if you've had a crossed phone line. And I'm going to also put a, uh, you know, a third person on. Has a third person come into your conversation all of a sudden on the phone, on a cell phone? You let me know. I'm going to do a poll on this on Twitter as well, by the way. So, uh, yeah, you want to watch out for that too. Look, here's the thing. As long as we do the system situation and we always overlook and don't look at what's controlling the people who do these things, the Donald Trumps, the Richard Nixons, the Reagans, the George W's, even the Obamas. I mean, look how many drones, drone strikes he administered. Look at how many people he deported. Come on. His foreign policy stuff was awful. Libya, Yemen, seriously, Syria. Oh, come on now. And no one wants to talk about that. See, that's part of the system too. When the corporate news media that you watch, MSNBC, does not talk about Obama's foreign policy or Biden's because Biden's ain't great either. But does talk about maybe the Republican foreign policy. Doesn't really talk about Hillary Clinton's when she was Secretary of State. We came, we bombed, he died. Remember that? Remember that? Remember that? She said that in an interview? Yeah, you've forgotten that already too, haven't you? Oh, yeah. You forgot. You forgot. You forgot. (laughs) Oh, I am in such a... I don't know what kind of mood. But come on now. You you forgot that. 
you forgot that your beloved uh, Secretary of State, Hillary Rodham Clinton, did say that in an interview. I saw the interview with my own two eyes, listened with my own two ears, and I did get tested for my hearing and my sight, and I did see what I saw. I sees what I sees, and I saws what I saws, and I heards what I heards with the ears that I ears, that I hears, that I hears. And I'm telling you, she did say that. You can Google, you can YouTube, you can whatever tube, you know. Tied or not, I'm telling you, she said that. But no one says anything about that. See, that's the odious thing, right? Is that because you're so fixated on a personality, aren't you? Well, not you. I don't want to sound like I'm yapping here because it does sound like that maybe to you sometimes. But I want to tell you, this is what happens. So you're so much in there, you generally, not you specifically. You're so invested. Oh, I'm with this person. I'm with her. I'm with him. You know, that when they do something wrong or evil, or if they rape somebody, you overlook it. Some some people overlook it. How can you overlook rape? I mean, yeah, granted, I voted for this guy. The guy that just won a few months back. And I acknowledged fully that the guy, in my view, raped Tara Reid. I still think that. And I worked as hard as I freaking well could to get him elected. So that maybe questions my... That kind of implicates me, though, doesn't it? I mean, if I'm going to sit here and talk to you, I mean, I've got to examine myself too, don't I? Of course I do. I mean, that makes me somehow complicit as part of this systemic arrangement, right? 50 years in politics? What does that make me, by the way? If I vote for someone who I think raped somebody, what does that make me? In fact, what does that make anybody? Are we accomplices in that fashion? Are we upholding a system? And if we are, what about it are we upholding? What parts of it that are we upholding? Everything? Or just the things that we don't like? Is a system necessary? I mean, I don't believe there should be true anarchy or anything like that. But is a system necessary? And the system that we have needs to be dismantled. It is not serving black folk well at all. And there's no need to pretend as if it does. It does not. We can stipulate that right now for a start. But I am intrigued about this. To what degree are we complicit in this system? Because it's not going to hold anybody accountable. It may get a few people here and there. But even this trial that's going to begin in two days, two days from now on the 9th of February, even if Donald Trump were to be convicted, and I'm still holding out something that he will, I know some of you are going, no chance. Why don't you call your Republican senators, 202, 202 rather, 225, 3121, 202, 224, 3121, before you give up so easily and ignore these headlines, these systemic news headlines that tell you what's going to be happening when we don't know for a fact yet. But to what degree do you think that he's going to be convicted? I mean, look, the accountability is never going to be about more than just a just a you know individual, because if they had to hold themselves accountable, then that gets everyone's attention. The system is on trial, and everybody turns their laser beams on it, and then there's no more system for the rich to be holding on to. The super uber rich families that control things. It's not being conspiratorial. It's true. Look at the look at the. Families that control these businesses. Look at the DeVos family. And look at the riches they have and the power they have. 
I'm telling you. You don't think they have something to do with this January 6th attack and all these other things. You really think that people are going to be held accountable for that attack, even if they do convict Trump? Look at all these Congress people. They're part of this thing. These Republicans, of course they are. You don't think they're going to be held accountable? You really think that they're going to be held accountable, I should say? Come on now. We really have to expand our imaginations. And they're not going to hold anybody accountable for the January 6th attack or the willful murders of nearly half a million people under Donald Trump's watch because of the fact that they didn't hold Richard Nixon accountable for Watergate or anything else. They didn't hold him accountable for treason that he committed in 1968. It's 1968. You heard that year again. They didn't hold Ronald Reagan accountable for anything to do with his treason in 1980 or the Iran-Contra stuff later on in that decade. They didn't hold anything or anybody accountable under George W. Bush and the lies of so-called weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Of course, they weren't there ever. Nobody holding them accountable. Nobody, 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 nobody. Nobody. But you know who did get held accountable? Apart from Donald Trump being impeached twice. Is William Jefferson Clinton. You know why he was impeached? Because he depended on what the meaning of is, is, or was. Is, was. Was, not was. Is, was. Was, is. It's just, it's unfathomable, isn't it? Huh? And we all know at least five other Republicans in that house back in 1998-99 they all were cheating we know that the speaker of the house before that Newt Gingrich was divorcing his dying wife and cavorting with Callista or whatever her name is come on or am I mixing up the women that Newt Gingrich a putrid character that he is was cavorting around with. Maybe I was getting mixed up. I don't know. But this is just... Oh, God. Oh, my God. You cannot beat the system at its game. You can protest against it and you can advocate to overthrow it. But the minute you go further than that and you've gained leverage... That's when the system decides it's time for you to go. And I know that's frightening and I know that's depressing, but it's the truth. And if you're listening to me, you do not come here for Skylock, even though I can. I'm well and truly capable of that, not just on this podcast, but beyond this podcast. But it's a really sobering thing. Because later on today, people are going to be watching the Super Bowl. And by the time... You might get to listen to this podcast. The Super Bowl would have finished for you or could have finished for you. Maybe you watched it. Maybe you didn't. But it's just unreal that people are not even looking at the system because that's what the system doesn't want you to look at. Because then you're forcing people to look at the entities that control the individuals that you've been squabbling about on Twitter or Facebook. Or maybe even Instagram. I think that's the thing. As long as we keep looking at individuals and personalities, that is one more way for the system to say, look over there and not over here. Look over there and not at me. Pay no attention to the to the man behind the curtain. That's how we stay where we are. And if we find excuses to relent and forget then we've already surrendered. What a terrible thing to do. We can't surrender. We have to keep educating people. We have to keep doing that. That's the very least of what we must do. Because we know that a lot of people aren't going to stand up tall when it really counts. But we have to keep pushing them to do so. 
which is why you must call 202-224-3121 or 202-225-3121. Call Republican senators right now. Call your House members right now. And by the way, call your local politicians and state politicians as well in your city and state. Please, you will be shocked at the difference that it could make. On this Sunday, a book recommendation. It is the autobiography of Malcolm X, as told to Alex Haley. What a riveting book. It's a book that really has influenced parts of my life. And I first read it, oh God, decades ago. It's a remarkable book. It's a life-changing book for many millions of people the world over. One of the most widely read books on planet Earth is the autobiography of Malcolm X. And I highly, highly recommend that you read it right now. Iago is the scariest character in any play Shakespeare ever wrote. He's, he's Hamlet gone the other way around. Mm-hmm. And actors are afraid of him. They don't want to play the tragedy of Iago. They rather play the farce. They play a flip, Iago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I, I don't want to get up on that. Yeah. Frank Finley's backstage now. He's coming <laughs> up, right? Uh, and, and then Bob Hoskins turned in a bigger <laughs> piece of crap with, with Jonathan Miller, the directing. As what? The, the, the TV version of, of, of Othello. Well, <laughs> oh, well, you know who that voice was. There were two male voices. I'm not talking about, well, if I mention one of those male voices, you'll know who the other one is. But you know the voice that I'm asking you to identify. So whose voice was that? Hint, hint, the distinctive voice. Whose voice was it? On that note, I will end this episode of the Politocrat Daily Podcast. Don't forget, you can head now to the Politocrat Daily Podcast online store for the brand new Spring Spectacular Collection for 2021. T-shirts, mugs, I almost said masks, but maybe they're coming soon. Mouse pads, tote bags, pens, calendars, sweatshirts. And much, much more. And more to come, by the way. So please don't forget to log on to my... Excuse me. Please don't forget to log on to the-politocrat.myshopify.com or to thepolitocrat.com and scroll down on the homepage. I want to... Well, say thank you uh, to you for your continued loyalty and for purchasing items from the online store. And I must say that those items are on their way. So hang tight. They will be there soon. I will keep you up to date. Be well, be safe. And thank you once again for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore.